Okay, all right. So, so welcome everybody once again. We're officially going to get started with, uh, I guess this would technically be the first town hall of um, 2021 here at Northern Virginia Family Practice. Uh, glad you could join us. Um, this is uh, a topic, uh, the vaccine that, that everybody's incredibly interested in learning more about. So it wasn't um, you know, difficult for us to think about what we should talk about during this, this, uh, this evening. Um, we receive uh, lots of phone calls, lots of emails, lots of inquiries about you know, the vaccine, where to get it. Uh, just, just information about the science behind it. So uh, this is a great opportunity. I'm glad we we're able to meet everybody and disseminate as much information as we have. Uh, as we've, I think, mentioned before, this information is constantly changing. Uh, what we talk about tonight could be different tomorrow in terms of where to get the vaccine. But you know, we're doing our best, and hopefully, we'll at least give you some avenues and some places that you can go to where you can reliably track this information. We're kind of a lot, we're, we're hearing about these things kind of in the same, you know, kind of same time as everybody else. So it's, you know, we're, we're not getting any, you know, special or, you know, secret information. So anyway, this evening, we are um, happy, uh, delighted to um, have a special uh, specialist with us this evening, a specialist in virology. This is Dr. Mike Habert. Um, if you're wondering, I will share that Dr. Mike Habert and I are married. We <laughs> Uh, we met in uh, Madison. We've been together for quite a while, but uh, happy that uh, Dr. Mike Habert is here with us. Um, he's been studying virology for about 30 years. He got his PhD at UW-Madison um, and also had two po postdoctoral fellowships, both at Johns Hopkins and at NIH. So that's kind of how we all ended up on the, uh, the East Coast. Um, he worked at the FDA for 15 years in the cell and gene therapy division. Uh, where he became very familiar with the adenovirus uh, vectors for preventing and treating disease. So we're going to, you're going to probably hear a little bit about um, that AstraZeneca, um, their, their vaccine model is one that uses the adenovirus vector. Um, Mike currently works in a biotechnology company uh, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Bluebird Bio. Um, there he, um, set, the, the company studies gene um, therapy, uh, works on gene therapy approaches to treating such diseases as sickle cell and multiple myeloma where mRNA um, technology, um, again, this is something we'll be talking about tonight, um, is being used. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to um, our guest speaker tonight. Welcome, Dr. Habert. Yeah, so I think um, just kind of give a level set. You guys didn't come to hear me talk. I think it's more of, you know, answering your questions, but I, I want to maybe level set a little bit about vaccines and how they're made, um, draw the curtain back a little bit on what happens for the manufacturers and kind of how the government works, if I can, a little bit. And, and so um, that's what um, my goal is. And so real quick, yeah, um, what got me interested in viruses was, you know, growing up in the 80s, um, HIV and AIDS pandemic was a big thing. And, you know, people didn't know what's going on. And um, that's that kind of drove my curiosity and interest. And there has been a big expansion in, you know, biotechnology, how you can um, study on a molecular level, how cells work, how viruses work. And now we're actually getting to a point where, you know, moving past vaccines, we're using viruses to deliver genes and gene therapy and as, as therapeutics. So it's an exciting area, you know, um, but the, the technology used for vaccines is tried and true. It's been around for hundreds of years um, and they've been regulated in the U.S. since about 1902. Um, more longer than say say drugs, you know, so we had regulated biologics before and you could kind of buy, um, you know, elixirs on the street. Uh, you couldn't buy diphtheria toxin on the street, for example, there are antivenins. So um, my experience is mostly with retroviruses and, and RNA viruses. Um, I wanna share my screen a little bit. Um, Hopefully you can see. Um, so we live in a uh, great area. NIH is right around the corner, right? NIH is a part of HHS, 
um, part of the executive branch, right? Um, you can go on their website. The National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease talks about vaccines. You can find information there. Um, I can put this link in the chat if people are interested. But to level set, um, typically vaccines are whole pathogen vaccines. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, whole pathogen like a, a virus or a bacteria that's been inactivated in some way or killed. So you have killed vaccines like the flu vaccine, the polio vaccine, or you can have live attenuated vaccines, those that have been maybe passaged in a different host, don't replicate as well in humans, don't cause disease in humans. And these are live attenuated vaccines. And that's kind of the mainstay of the, the vaccines that we have. You can break a piece off of the virus or bacteria, and these are subunit vaccines. Um, both of these are tried and true methods, and they involve growing large amounts of the virus or bacteria um, or a subunit of that and killing it or uh, and then formulating it and putting it into vials for for vaccine. What's new is these nucleic acid vaccines, and that's what the um, Pfizer vaccine is, and the, uh, the Moderna vaccine, and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And you don't have to have the virus itself to, to make these vaccines. All you need is the genetic sequence, and um, in particular, the genetic sequence of the outside of the virus that you're directing immune response to. So they're very fast and very efficient, but they're not, you know, we have, they're somewhat new. Um, in the past 20 years or so, they've been developed and we have something that works for flu and these other diseases. Nobody's really keen to change. It's when a pandemic hits that, that we can really put these into play. And that's what uh, folks have done with Operation Warp Speed. So I'll pause right there. Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> so I wanted to share a little video on the mRNA vaccine, which is um, the Pfizer vaccine and the, um, the Moderna vaccine, just kind of how they work. And I'm a visual person, um, so seeing how seeing a cartoon helps me understand. So I hope that um, this will help you also. So this is a video from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. And um, um, for, for the past 30 years or so, they've been involved in, it's a nonprofit and their goal is to um, kind of advocate for um, um, new drugs uh, for the treatment of disease and mRNAs. Nucleic acid vaccines are one approach. And I've been involved with this group for, uh, for some time and, they have a website you can go and find more information about um, their products and diseases. So we'll just play this. Society of Gene and Cell Therapy is a nonprofit organization dedicated to discovering and developing gene and cell therapies to fight disease. And many of our members are scientists who have spent years researching messenger RNA biology and its potential use in vaccines. Vaccines prevent illnesses, save countless lives, and have greatly reduced or eliminated several diseases. But what is an mRNA vaccine? And how does it work against the virus that causes COVID-19? Well, mRNAs are molecules within the body that contain genetic instructions for cells to make various proteins that are required for the body to function properly. mRNA vaccines deliver synthetic mRNA molecules into cells. I just pause right there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. So you've got the, this is the vaccine. It's kind of a, a lipid a nanoparticle almost, almost like a little molecular machine. It's delivering an mRNA, which is the genetic instructions. It's not DNA, it's, it's the intermediate between the DNA instructions in the nucleus to what's transcribed into protein in the, in the cytoplasm of the infected cell. And what it's gonna transcribe is the spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2 and then present that to the immune system and you mount an antibody response to, to that spike protein. Instructing them to make antigens. 
An antigen is typically a foreign invader that the immune system recognizes as not being part of itself, such as the protein surface of a virus. For the COVID-19 vaccine, cells are instructed to only make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is just enough to activate the immune system. But the cells are not given enough instructions to build the full virus, so the vaccine cannot cause COVID-19. These antigens then trigger the immune system to produce specific protective antibodies that neutralize the virus. In this case, the antibodies needed to fight COVID-19. If a person is exposed to SARS-CoV-2, the immune system will detect the familiar antigens and produce antibodies to attack them. A vaccinated person's immune system can better defend against the infection altogether or greatly reduce the severity of the infection. An mRNA vaccine for COVID-19 requires two doses, three to four weeks apart, to be effective. mRNA vaccines are cost-effective and quick to manufacture, expanding access to more people. Now, let's talk about the creation of mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. First, it's important to know that mRNA vaccines have been researched for the last 20 years with the hopes of fighting diseases such as cancer, rabies, Ebola, and the Zika virus. So the research was ready to be applied to this new virus. All COVID-19 vaccines are studied in clinical trials and are strictly reviewed by an agency that oversees medical products. In the United States, this is done by the Food and Drug Administration, known as the FDA. Clinical trials study how a treatment interacts with the body and if it is safe and effective before it can be made available to the public. It's true that COVID-19 vaccines have been developed with record-setting speed, but that doesn't mean they aren't held to the same safety and efficacy standards as other treatments. Clinical trials may take years, but the FDA has pathways and programs in place to accelerate the development of drugs or therapies that treat or prevent serious diseases and public health emergencies. Trial results have been positive. Here to explain more is ASGCT President, Dr. Stephen Russell. During the course of clinical trials, mRNA vaccines have been shown to reduce the risk of adults getting COVID-19 by over 90% and to virtually eliminate the risk of severe disease. Importantly, there were also no significant safety concerns in these clinical trials. COVID-19 has cast a dark cloud over our world, disrupting, changing, and ending lives. This is a virus that we need to fight together. And if enough people receive vaccines, it will build protection against the virus in our communities. For more information on the mRNA vaccine, visit patienteducation.asgct. Okay, I'll, I'll stop right there. I think you get the idea. Um, mRNA vaccine, there's also a uh, viral vector um, uh, vaccine. So this is the AstraZeneca vaccine where it's a recombinant virus that's uh, an inactivated cold virus, an adenovirus that's used to express the uh, SARS-CoV uh, glycoprotein also. So that's the second one. It takes a little longer to make the virus. Um, that's why mRNA has been a little bit faster out of the gate. Cool. Okay. All right. And I, and I think there are some other questions that, that we'll be getting to um, regarding that. But now that we're all um, uh, experts on mRNA vaccines and the COVID vaccine in, in particular, we'll go ahead and we'll um, jump into some of the questions. Um, I have to say that um, we received a lot of amazing questions. You guys are um, you know, got good, good heads on your shoulders. There's some great questions that came through. We're going to do our best to, uh, to try to answer them to the best of our ability, of course. And uh, we'll start um, with Natasha. Are you ready? Okay. Sure. So, um, so Natasha, can we just actually start by talking about why do we need to vaccinate? Um, you know, why is it important to get the COVID vaccine? Well, I think for um, in the middle of a pandemic, we have a couple of choices. You know, one, we can stay in our house forever. Um, two, we can interact with others and bear the risk of illness and spreading illness. Or three, we can get vaccinated to protect both ourselves and to protect others. Um, our goal and as, as health professionals is to prevent disease and to help prevent the spread of disease. And we 
we will, we're, we're, our goal is to try to achieve herd immunity, whether we get it through getting sick or whether we get it through getting vaccinated. And when, when we have enough immunity in a community to make the illness less of a problem, we've reached a threshold where enough people, we probably need 70 or 80% of people to have been exposed and immune to this virus in order to, um, to keep the rest of the community safe. So our two routes here, since, we, since we're in the middle of a pandemic, are either getting sick or getting vaccinated. And so we, we really look at the risk benefit analysis, number one, against doing nothing, and number two, against getting sick. And so vaccines and, and all preventive treatments need to be safer than doing nothing. And so, when we develop a vaccine, we have to look at that and say, look, we're gonna do no harm. First, we do no harm. And so if we look at the, the 300,000 people so far in our country, or the, what, what is it, five, five million people have gotten vaccinated so far, and we have had about, I think, 12 um, allergic reactions, and, We'll probably have more, but all of those people are safe and well today after they've been treated. And so we can say that this vaccine is very, very safe in so far as it's been used throughout the year. Um, and the risk of COVID, of course, bears a 1% risk of death and also a 10% risk of long-term side effects. And, and a lot of what the doctors are seeing now, in addition to the sadness of losing lots of people, is the, the, the very real and long-term problems people are living with after they've had this virus. So I think number one, the, the vaccine is safe. And number two, the risk is either a 1% risk of, if we don't do it as a 1% risk of death or a 10% risk of long-term uh, long side effects of the coronavirus. So it seems like it's more risky to get COVID than to get the vaccine. Dramatically so more risky dramatic. to get COVID. So, and, so yeah, that's dramatically, another <laughs> right. And more so, risky. And how well, yeah, how well does the um does the vac vaccine prevent against COVID? This one's how still for me. Yeah, still this for is me. for you. This is for you, Natasha. Yeah. I'll keep going with you. So the um the the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, the mRNA vaccines that Mike talked about first are about 95% effective. And for those 5% for, for whom there's still a possibility of getting coronavirus, it eliminates the risk of severe disease. So although people in the studies, in the initial studies, which uh, included over 70,000 people, there were people having placebo the vaccine, were 95% prevented from getting coronavirus, but the 5% who did get it got very mild cases. So it's incredibly, it's more effective than, than anything we've created to date in, in a vaccine. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Natasha. We'll move on to Ken. So it sounds like um, the vaccine protects me. Does that mean I can stop wearing a mask after I get it and go to maybe a big wedding or, um, you know, go out to eat? Um, and um, also, will I shed the virus after I get the vaccine? So can you speak a little bit about what, what it means after we get the vaccine? How are we going to go about our lives? Even if you get the vaccine early, it doesn't mean that you can go out bar hopping just yet. Um, but, you know, as she said, the vaccine is our best chance to getting society back to normal again. So what you need to realize is, as of this vaccine, first of all, the two that we have, it's two shots that are three to four weeks apart. And then it takes another two to four weeks to really develop immunity. So we'd say another month afterwards. So essentially it's a two month process from when you start getting your first shot to when you truly are immune. Unfortunately, as we said, there's still a 5% risk of getting the vaccine, of getting uh, COVID after you've gotten the shot. That's low, but more importantly, what we don't know yet is whether you can transmit the, vac the uh, COVID after you've been vaccinated. Yeah. Some vaccines, will make uh, the uh, risk of con uh, being contagious, down, uh, bring it down to zero. So other vaccines do decrease the risk, but they don't make it zero, such as the flu vaccine. You can still transmit the flu even if you've been vaccinated. And so we don't know which category the COVID vaccine is gonna fall into. And so until we know that, not only to protect yourself, but to protect others, 
we really recommend that you all continue to wear the mask after you get vaccinated until this pandemic really is over and until we have a majority of people who are vaccinated and, and we know that we can keep each other safe. So we're still going to be probably masking for a while. And, and, and like I said, even though you might be protected, you also want to make sure you protect others. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, Mike, um, how soon, or Dr. Havert, um, how soon after the second dose of the um, COVID vaccine will I be immune? And how long will this last? And um, also, will this be like the flu vaccine or what can you tell us? I know that at this point that the data is somewhat limited, but what can you tell us about this? Yeah, um, so I can point you to the clinical trials, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, where they talk about the endpoints. Um, but it, it, I think we all wanna know when is it gonna be back to normal? When can I, when am I, when can I get my life back on track? Um, and that's the longer term. Uh, so you can do an experiment, right? A, a epidemiology experiment. And that's basically what a clinical trial was. And it takes um, the window for looking for an event, getting COVID in the Moderna trial was two weeks after the second dose. So two weeks to get immunity. Uh, I think the AstraZeneca was one week. Um, certainly after the first dose, you are starting to generate an immune response. So even after the first dose, after one week, you're you're probably generating immune response. Whether you um, are protected from the vaccine at that point or not, it's an unknown, right? They haven't done that clinical study. When are we going to get protected from the virus, right? Virus, yeah. 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 Protected. And I think the end point in these clinical studies was symptomatic COVID positive disease. So you had to have, I believe, fever. You had to have muscle aches, showing symptoms, then getting tested and, and being positive by the test. So um, how long will it last? How, will, how long will it last, our immunity? Yeah, again, we don't, um, we don't really know. I haven't done the clinical trials. With these mRNA vaccines, though, they're pretty fast to make. Um, and you can generate them quickly. This virus doesn't mutate like a retrovirus does or like the flu virus. Um, it's a pretty stable virus, so you're not constantly introducing new mutations. We're just starting to get ones that spread better in the human population. Um, but um, part of the reason why the flu virus is problematic and you have vaccines generated every year is the virus mixes with wild populations of geese and pigs, and you get these recombinants um, that come into the human population and that and that spread. And, and so we don't have, uh, this virus doesn't behave that way. It's got different um, genetic bones, basically. It doesn't spread uh, within other populations that we know of to cause recombination. That would be um, yearly vaccinations. But um, that's all hand-waving. We, we, you know, if our immunity wanes, um, well, with an mRNA vaccine, which we don't have a lot of experience with, it, it may wane. Um, we'll probably have to get boosts yearly. So yeah, I, I think the clinical trials, I and mean, we've only you know looked at data a couple months out, and it shows that you know there is immunity. However, we still need to find out if this immunity is going going to last. So I, it's just unfortunately that that's somewhat of a question. We may be getting boosters, but we'll, we'll that. We'll, we'll have to figure that out as, as we go along. Um, I, did read, I, I did read one study in yeah. Science Magazine this morning that said uh, as of eight months, they still have immunity. So okay. that's only, This is the that's, people who got the vaccines? The vaccines early, yeah. So these are okay. that's as long as time has gone after these vaccines yeah. have been created. Which is great. And what we'd like to do is we'd like these vaccines to actually last longer than the immunity that one would get from getting COVID. Um, we're starting to see that actually people who get COVID, their antibodies and their immunity does start to wane after some time. So the goal would be to make a vaccine that's actually going to make us immune for a longer period of time. So in that sense, getting the vaccine is better than getting the disease for lots of different reasons. We did talk to the, that, uh, another virologist on Tuesday night. Uh, who was actually part of development of these vaccines. And he seemed to think based on his previous experience that these could last as long as two to five years and that you would only need to be revaccinated every five years at, at, in a best case scenario. Uh, other things I've seen is that if we do need to get vaccinated every year, 
they're going to try to mix the flu and COVID vaccine. So you still only get one shot and it would just be a routine thing like we get the flu shot. And that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that COVID is going to be around with us. I think it's going to be a virus that that will be man that that's going to be with us. But hopefully we're going to get it under control with uh, with the vaccine and, and, and just good, good public health management. So. Um, okay, so moving a little bit into who's getting the vaccine and when. So, um, Dr. Zweig, um, can you describe, the CDC has come up with these different groups and different orders for, uh, you know, when people are going to get this vaccine. Can you describe um, the breakdown and uh, who's included in these different groups? So, uh, what they did, first of all, there's a group called the ACIP, which is actually before the CDC, uh, and they are a group that really comes up with all the recommendations for any vaccine that any of us have gotten. And so, they're the main uh, uh, entity that comes up with who should get what vaccines and whether it's worthwhile. And then they recommend to the CDC what they think they should do. And then the CDC can either accept or decline or change those recommendations. And so then the CDC has come up with these, the, the, the collaboration between the two has come up with these recommendations that they've again given to the states. And then the states then can decide whether they wanna follow these guidelines or not. Most states have, um, some are um, gonna change or, or change it to some degree, but what they they kept in mind when they were making these recommendations is that they wanted to keep in mind two factors. One, they wanna decrease morbidity and mortality. So morbidity are things like hospitalization and long-term problems and then mortality is death. And then they also want to dec uh, to maintain societal function, what they call societal functions. So they want to keep society running as best as possible. And so they kept both of those factors in mind when they decided who to give what shots and when. And so they came up with a, this the groups of 1A, B, C, and then 2. And in the 1A group is anybody in uh, who's either residing or working in a long-term care facility like a nursing home because this is a group that's at very high risk for morbidity and mortality. These are generally very ill people, uh, typically elderly people with a lot of medical problems, living in close proximity to each other, so the virus can spread very easily. And it's, a, it's just a perfect uh, storm for COVID to uh, wreak havoc in these places. So to prevent the morbidity and mortality, getting the uh, long-term care facilities vaccinated first made a lot of sense from that standpoint. To preserve societal function, from the 1A standpoint, they decided that medical care workers were uh, the priority. Uh, and so obviously that makes sense during a pandemic, you wanna make sure that the people who are taking care of the sick people who are getting sick during pandemic are well themselves, especially because they are also the ones that are high risk for being exposed because they're being in, on the front lines with uh, people who have COVID. So that's where the 1A group comes in and we're in that phase right now. 1B is anybody who's 75 or older uh, and frontline essential workers. And so these are people like uh, uh, first responders, such as police and firemen and EMTs. It's teachers, which we all want to get our kids back to school and get the schools open again. That's essential for so many reasons. Uh, anybody in, in food production, it's not restaurants, but uh, essential food. So agriculture, uh, grocery store workers, anybody in food manufacturing or packaging, things like that. Uh, and then public transit workers and postal workers. So anybody that can really is really critical to getting society back up and running again. And then 1C is anybody 65 to 74 or under 65 with a chronic disease that puts them at higher risk for COVID such as emphysema, kidney disease, heart failure, uh, type two diabetes. Uh, immunosuppression or cancer because what happens if you say well you've got diagnosed with diabetes five years ago lost a ton of weight and not being treated and you're back to normal or if you have very mild copd does uh, emphysema does, does where is the the cutoff and and how are they going to determine that does it mean that you're going to need a note from your doctor or you get to show your medications we don't really know so we'll have to see that's probably still to be determined how they do the high risk uh conditions part of that it also includes what they say, other essential workers. So that's now restaurant workers, IT and communications, people in um, uh, utilities uh, and uh, media, uh, law and lawyers. You can say what you want about how, being essential, but uh, so uh, but those are the people in the one C. And then uh, group two is going to be really everybody else who uh, doesn't fall in those first categories. Um, 
and there was, uh, I think part of this question also somebody had asked about autoimmune disease and whether that falls into a high risk category. That's a, a hard question to answer because autoimmune disease is a very vague statement. Um, there's so many of them, they have, they're so variable and how severe they are plays a role. Really autoimmune disease means you actually have too much immune function. And so we tend to give immunosuppressants to get it under control. And so if you're on a moderate or severe or, or highly potent immunosuppressant for autoimmune disease, then yeah, you probably would fall into the high risk category. But other than that, it, it's probably a case by case basis though autoimmune is not typically listed as a high risk disease. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zwei, that was very well, well stated. Um, and so Natasha, now that we've talked a little bit, or Dr. Bovey, now that we've talked a little bit about these different categories, these different risk categories, um, let's dive in a little bit um, into some of the nuances about this. And how do individuals fit in who are caring for high-risk individuals who maybe aren't high-risk themselves, however, they're taking care of high-risk um, individuals? And then also, how do you reconcile those who have to go out and work in a public setting and then come back and care for the very, very young or the very old? Mm -hmm. Sure, these are really good questions. I mean, first of all, whoever the high risk person is, hopefully they're gonna be able to get vaccinated. And so that would be step one, is get, get those who are able to be vaccinated, vaccinated. Um, step, step two, what do we, or the next question, what do we do if we're caring for someone that's in a high risk category and we have to kind of interact with the world? I think part of the answer to that is to continue to do what we have been doing, which is wearing a mask and making sure that those around you are wearing a mask. And um, you know, we're 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 living a little version of that, I think, in all the people in healthcare where they go home to their families and basically they're really just making sure that they're um, completely protected, universally protected as as much as possible all the time. And that's a way to feel less at risk while you're out in the world. But it's certainly, we're gonna have to wait months before we can kind of feel normal doing normal activities. So it, it still will require you to dramatically cut back on your previous, your prior to the pandemic lifestyle until you're able to come up and get vaccinated. I will say that the vaccine process is going faster than I expected it to go. It's dramatically, um, rolling out, I, I, there's been a lot of criticisms about the rollout, but I have found the rollout to be quite amazing. I mean, 5 million people in the United States have been vaccinated already. Just locally here, Inova Hospital has, Inova, has vaccinated 17,000 people in the healthcare world. Um, Fairfax County has done their community health workers and they've, I think their number was about 10,000 so far. They got started a little bit later than Inova did. And it's, it's clear to us that very soon they're going to be able to give the vaccine to the next groups of people. So I think the, the question is not whether or not everyone's gonna be able to get vaccinated, it's just which month. Um, and all of us will be vaccinated sooner than I ever dreamed. Yeah, if you think about it, it's a pretty massive um, uh, undertaking that we're doing to try to vaccinate the entire population of the United States, or most, I guess. Mm -hmm. population of the United States. So it's, um, you know, in the beginning, we're going to expect that there's going to be a few bumps in the road and everything. But I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, things are going to speed up. The other thing is that I'm um, going back to Dr. Zweig and those different categories. The reason that those categories came out is we're going to use those categories when there's a vaccine shortage. If and when we get to a point when, when there is enough vaccine, for, that we can start distributing it, we don't, basically it's gonna be just go and get your vaccine. So we don't necessarily even need to rely on that. So, you know, sometimes people are kind of stuck on, well, which, which um, category am I in? Is my doctor gonna, do I have to get a, a doctor's note um, in order to say I'm a B, I'm a 1B, 1C? You know, first of all, we don't know if that's, if that's gonna be the case, but probably, you know, I wouldn't necessarily worry about it at this point because it, it may be a moot point. You may be the 1Bs and Cs might be, getting their vaccines around the same time. So, so I would just, it's just kind of, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. But it is frustrating because we all are very, very anxious about getting back to, uh, to real life. So. Um, okay, so next question is for um, Dr. Havert, Dr. Mike. Um, so can you speak a little bit to the um, decision? So what's happening is that uh, a couple of different things are going on. In the United States, um, there, there's some, 
there was a question that came in that said, are we worried that we're going to, um, you know, run out of the second, we'll get the first dose, but then we'll run out of the second dose. So is this a concern? And actually the answer to that is in the United States, no. What, what seemed, what the plan was to actually hold that second dose. So, uh, so is, but can you speak a little bit to the public health decision to hold the second dose for individuals rather than, I guess the other option would be just to try to vaccinate as many people as possible, but maybe run out of the second dose. So, which is I think the, the approach that they're doing in the UK. So it's kind of a difficult question um, and scenario, but Dr. Havard, can you, can you speak a little bit to maybe why we chose to do it this way in the United States? Well, you're calling an audible here. You need a quarterback to stand up and say, you know, this is this is the plan. I'm going to take responsibility, and we're changing things. So rewind six months. Um, these mRNA vaccines that were designing the clinical trial, we knew we'd get them out fast. We didn't know they'd be 90% effective, or 95% effective. We didn't know that they were going to generate such a robust immune response and, and protection. Um, we do have single shot vaccines coming down the pike. So that's coming. Um, we, we always thought we needed two, and that's the way the clinical trials were done. You needed two. So if someone wants to stand up and say, um, this is a, we just don't have, um, it, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good idea. There's, there's merit to that. And what doesn't make sense to wait for the single shot vaccine? No, <laughs> I would agree with that. I think that probably the, the when you get an opportunity to get a vaccine, it's you know it's take it. it's, it's an opportunity to get a vaccine. Um, we know that the studies were done that showed that it's effective after two vaccines. So in the United States, we decided that it's important that we make sure that you will be able to get your second vaccine once you get your first. So that's that's just how things are things are rolling out here. Um, Okay. Uh, okay. So, Dr. Zweig, I think we might have alluded a little bit to this, but who is in charge of the vaccine rollout here in the U.S.? And is there a timeline for this? And another question I think that's even come up in the chat is, you know, we gave the information about the Alexandria um, County or Alexandria City, but what about crossing um, lines? Will will people from, say, Fairfax County be able to go to Arlington and Alexandria and into D.C.? So, what, what's what's the thinking on all this? And it was actually a lot harder to answer than I had anticipated. Uh, at the high level, it was pretty easy to find the information. It's uh, the, the Operation Warp Speed that you probably have all heard about is a collaboration between uh, HHS and the Department of Defense. And there's a man named General Perna, who is the head of this operation. Um, and their responsibility was to decide how many shots to buy, how, how they were going to distribute it to the states uh, and prioritize who, wh where the, uh, the shots were going to go and how they were going to get there. Once they got to the states, then it was going to be more up to the, each individual state and, uh, to decide how they would uh, disseminate them, where it would go, how the, uh, uh, how the counties would decide, and, and a lot of factors like that. Um, I had the, uh, and I had a lot of difficulty finding this information. So I actually, uh, fortunately, had the opportunity to talk to a gentleman this afternoon who is in charge of this distribution in Alexandria. And so what he said is the reason why it's difficult to find that information is because there are, are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. There is, uh, you know, the, the departments of health and the local levels, the county, uh, there's the state, there's the national and CDC, and, and everyone's involved in these decision makings. And then you know, when you get INOVA, they're not part of INOVA or VHC or, or Centara, they're not part of the county and they have their own say on how this is gonna be distributed and everybody sort of has their own say. And then it all eventually, at least on, uh, on the government level, all has to go back to the governor. And so Northam has to sign off on anything that happens. And it's sort of a very convoluted way of doing business and, and difficult to, to, to track down and find the one decision maker. Um, but um, basically what it comes down to, according to him, you know, he said a few things. One, there um, is software that's helping them with it, it's tracking them, that, they're ha that they built for this purpose, and the software is a little clunky and difficult to use. Um, like I said, they have to go through the governor's office to really get approval for everything, and, and there's some uh, delay in that. Um, and, and so a lot, of, a lot of things have to happen to make it all work. And so it can get a little uh, sticky. Um, 
But where we stand right now, we're obviously in, in 1A. Uh, he thinks that we are going to get to 1B in the third or fourth week of January, so in, in about two or three weeks. I've even seen some places doing it before that. Certainly, the goal is to get everybody who wants a vaccine, which is hopefully most people, vaccinated by the summer, by the end of June. That is the goal. They want to do about 50,000 shots a day. And so that's the timeline. Uh, it's going to be varied in every county and how they do things. And so a lot depends on how many in the 1A group want to get it. So we distributed, say, you know, 50,000 doses to Northern Virginia for the 1A group. But if only 30,000 people want to get it, there's 20,000 vaccine doses that are sitting there they're not going to wait until the whole state goes to 1B. They're going to say, all right, here, you know, let's, let's start moving on and get to 1B. And that is happening in some places. Um, I, I talked to somebody today, who I know got their shot uh, sort of under the table because there wasn't really announced or supposed to happen, but they're starting to do that somewhat in Loudoun County and some other places because they don't want the shots to, to go bad. There's no reason for us to wait until everybody gets it. If there's slots open and shots available, move on to 1B. I think that's what's going to happen. So um, we're all trying to coordinate as best as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is, it, as uh, Dr. Bovet said, it, it is moving along very quickly. It is an incredibly, incredibly complex system that has to work uh, for it all to happen the right way.